Hello, BookTube. And greetings from what I suppose we would call a bleak and barren Monday. <laughs> On a couple of different fronts. It's, it's dark as, as twilight, and it's been snowing all day. And in addition to that, it's a holiday. It's a federal holiday. So there's no mail. Uh, I might get... I might, I actually, I might have thought that I might get uh, deliveries from the services that aren't the U.S. mail, but not if it's if it's snowing steadily all day. They, they'll just give it a miss, especially since it's a holiday. They'll just skip it. Uh, so I didn't get any mail, and I doubt that I'm going to. And I didn't get any mail yesterday, of course, because it was a Sunday. But I did get mail on Saturday. And two of the things I got on Saturday I have not looked at yet. I'm so behind in reading that I have not looked through. So I thought we'd go through them together. They, we won't, I won't. I'll try not to bore you, <laughs> but there, there are two periodicals, two great periodicals. There's Harper's, and there's uh, the New York Review of Books. Uh, so I thought we'd see uh, what we have here. What, what, Like, for instance, in the table of contents, I think there's one thing from this Harper's that I've already seen. Um, yes, the lead-off article, the thing on the cover, is Andrew Cockburn writing uh, a political hit piece about Joe Biden. Former Vice President Joe Biden uh, is considering a presidential run in 2020 if he, he if he goes into the race the numbers the polling numbers the initial polling numbers which don't mean anything uh say that simple name recognition would have him doing really well at least initially and cockburn writes a uh, a uh, a summary of his political life that is intentionally damning. And I'd already read the article because it was one of those ones that gets a little buzz online so you can see it linked on Twitter or whatnot. And I followed some of those links and read it even though I knew it was coming in the mail. And it infuriated me. Uh, Cockburn can do much better work than this. This was sloppy and bad. It was unfair. Uh, it took a 50-year life in, public, in the public service uh, and cherry-picked all the worst things without giving any space to the good things, implying, as cherry-picking always does, that there aren't any good things. It's, it was maddening from start to finish, and I'm no Biden fan. I, back in the 1980s, I was writing blistering editorials about him for uh, then a plagiarism scandal that he was that he was involved in that no one remembers now, but uh, back then, <laughs> the times were just naive enough so that I could say that Clearly, this showed that he was not qualified to be president. <laughs> uh, um, in, in fact, he is easily more qualified to be president than anyone else who could run in 2020. He's, he's had a, an enormous legislative history, and it's not fair for Cockburn to go into a picture that long and that complicated and try and make it seem simple and bad. It was neither simple nor exclusively bad. Uh, and if... The 2016 presidential election, with a third of the country voting for someone specifically because he had no experience, uh, if if maybe that has been shown to be a bad idea, then maybe what we want to do is now vote for someone who does have experience. It's not going to matter because Trump is going to win in 2020. But uh, that was is the idea that I would that I would pursue instead of flooding the field with people who just have sound bites and ideas. I don't know if Biden is going to run. But I'm really hoping that pieces like this don't don't gain any traction. A, a fairer look, it would be a better look. Uh, that, you know, come to think of it, as long as we're as long as I'm touting bipartisanship, that always bothered me about the long pro, the long form political profiles of Mitt Romney that I read when he was running for president. Uh, that always that tended to crop up in those as well. That kind of cherry picking and that tended to bother me as well. Uh -huh. uh, even though, again, I'm no Mitt Romney fan. Uh, but what else we got here? What else what we got here? Sally Tisdale writes a, a book about the uh, sea lion problem on the Columbia River and, uh, on the west coast of, of America, where they they're they're not hunted, so they're breeding, so they're everywhere, and they're they're able to walk on land. So sometimes they heave themselves out of the water and waddle to the nearest intersection, just sun themselves, and don't care about you know cars or anything, people or anything like that. Uh, and if I remember correctly, from, from again glancing at, at online snippets of the article, uh, the article asks over and over again in increasingly plaintive tones, "What's to be done about this?" And you all know my answer. <laughs> my answer is sit in your car and wait. They were here first by about four hundred million years. They were here first. So if you're not going to take the depraved, the normal depraved human route of simply killing them, killing anything, anything around you that's living that you don't like, that's inconvenience you in any way, kill it. <laughs> don't relocate it. Don't move it. Don't teach it. Don't, for instance, endure it. No, no. If you're human, because evolutionarily speaking, Homo sapiens is a miswired, a mis, 
designed species, something that, that evolved in a hyper minute through a very niche specialty without anything else evolving along with it. So humans are by nature damaged. And when they see a problem, their first instinct is to kill it and anything else that looks like it, even if the other things that look like it are tens of thousands of miles away and aren't part of the problem. Genocide is the very first thing that little you don't even have to you don't even have to wait until you're miseducated. Little children. Little children will see a toad, they will crush it with a brick, and their first thought will be, I want to crush all the toads. <laughs> Uh, so, but, but but if that isn't your response, if you if you are going to say, uh, like the shop owners and the, the legislators do in this article, if you're going to say we're not going to do that, obviously we're not going to do that, uh, then the only other alternative is to let them have their way. Maybe gently build things so that so to, that that the structures of which encourage them to go elsewhere or to do other things, but uh, nothing other than that. <laughs> but but what about? What about literarily speaking? What have we got? What have we got? Because uh, Harper's has has uh, they they run a, a a short story. I'm ashamed to say I usually don't read them. Uh, I usually don't skip anything in magazines, but I've been so disappointed by short stories in Harper's that I tend not to read them. Uh, but then we have Christopher Taylor reviewing new books. Uh, and what does he do? Uh, he reviews Where Reason Ends by Yi Yun Lee. He reviews The End of Myth uh, by Greg Grandin about uh, the myth of the open frontier. Uh, and, oh, <laughs> look at that. He, re he reviews Paul Cosman's Time and Its Adversaries in the Seleucid Empire. We saw that on this channel. A book about how the Seleucid Empire invented many of our bedrock concepts of what time is. Uh, and here it is getting three columns of review in the Harper's Magazine. That's great. That's fantastic. I would expect it to be the kind of uh, scholarly thing that would just disappear without popular notice. Although I love the book. I thought it was fantastic. Uh, then we have Christopher Beha reviewing the Nocilla trilogy by Augustine Fernandez Malo. I don't think I've received that. I don't think I know anything about it. But the subtitle <laughs> to the to the uh, review is Spain's answer to, answer to Nosgard arrives in English. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Next. <laughs> uh, then, uh, okay, well, the next one is a, a review of two books by the uh, talentless artist Cy Twombly, one of which we saw on this channel, Chalk, by Joshua Rivkin. It's a biography of Cy Twombly. It's fantastic. It actually made my Steve Reed's list of the best biographies of the year last year. Um, and then there's another one, another... Uh, Yale University Press volume on Cy Twombly, and the article is written by someone named Andrew Martin. Let's see what he has to say, shall we, Booktube? Uh, after years of skepticism, I have come to see in Twombly's best paintings a poignant dramatization of the artist's dilemma. The canvas is giving host to competing impulses towards both aesthetic mastery and ugly, blunt force. Should have stuck with the initial years of skepticism there, me boyo. <laughs> Oh God, it goes on forever. Ah, okay, all right, here we go. <laughs> uh, this is uh, an example, presumably, of what the reviewer considers to be aesthetic mastery. Feast your eyes, booktube. That is aesthetic mastery. That is a painting by Cy Twombly. That is aesthetic mastery. That would cost you several million dollars to buy. That's the painting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> yes indeed. Okay. Well, uh, and then that's it. That's it for Harper's. But we can move on. We can move on to New York Review of Books. Because New York Review of Books is the, is the uh, mirror image of Harper's. It will have a couple of pieces on politics, but all the rest will be literary. Uh, so what, what have we got here? Let's see. Uh, let's see what we've got here. Um, full page color ads. Uh, a big article about the Me Too movement in Korea. Okay. <laughs> All, right. All right. There is a nice long review of the latest book by Alejandro Zambra, who I just love. I think he's fantastic. Even in English translation, I think he's he's fantastic. I think I've reviewed a couple of his books. Uh, and he has his newest one is called Not to Read. Uh, and it's it's not a feather in his cap. It's it's all about uh, mo it's it's actually largely about um, the same kind of reading shortcuts 
lazinesses and rationalizations about reading that crop up often on booktube <laughs> only this, only here in in uh, slightly uh epicene highfalutin literary justifications so just read your books <laughs> okay read your books okay if you don't want to make the time to read your books then don't and don't call yourself a reader just abandon that whole self-characterization and characterize yourself some other way if you do want to consider yourself a reader then read Okay? <laughs> All right? Don't develop a, an extremely arcane and multi-point system about how soon and how readily you will stop reading a book. Huh? Wrong conjunction on page two. You blew it. No, no. Just read. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Instead of coming up with enormous justification systems for why you won't read, or why it's not the right moment, or why Aries isn't in the right house, or whatever. <laughs> but but I, I haven't actually read uh, not to read. Uh, I've only read bits and pieces. I read, I think, two of the pieces, two chunks of what was in it. Alejandro Zamba is a fantastic writer, so that's not why I'm rolling my eyes. I'm rolling my eyes because this piece is by Andrew Martin. He's <laughs> all over these things, like Virginia Creeper. <laughs> Let's, uh, it is much... Uh, the specter of obligatory readings haunts not to read. Zombra's collection of reviews, essays, and lectures. It's also the title of the first essay in the book about an early unhappy encounter with Madame Bovary in middle school. I feel sure, Zombra writes, that those teachers didn't want to inspire enthusiasm for books, but rather to deter us from them, to put us off books forever. They didn't waste their spit extolling the joys of reading, perhaps because they had lost the joy or had never really felt it. To which our Andrew Martin responds, uh, It is much to the benefit of his fellow readers, then, that through whatever alchemy turns oppressed students into book-mad adults and put upon book reviewers into compulsively engaging literary evangelists, would that it happened more often, Zambra has emerged as one of the most perceptive and generous writers on literature currently at work. Okay, well, I kind of agree with that, but good lord, why, doesn't this guy sleep? <laughs> why, why is this Andrew Martin person in all of my literary reviews? Probably some pretty boy who slept his way to the top. <laughs> you know the type. Wide shoulders, wavy blonde hair. <laughs> Called that one a mile away. <laughs> well, what else have we got? If we can get past Andrew Martin. Okay, there's a, about Trump's imaginary literary caravan. That's, that's a... Oh, oh, fantastic. Lynn Hunt does a double review of Diderot and the Art of Thinking Freely and Catherine and Diderot, two books on Dennis Diderot that came out at the same time. I think I said when I got one of them that I predicted that if they were reviewed at all, they'd be reviewed together. And this book, this is a nice, long review of both of them together. Fantastic. Uh, okay. Uh, then there's a, a movie review of some kind. Two books on Sufism. Uh... Edward Mendelssohn reviews a book from Columbia University Press called Facing the Abyss, American Literature and Culture in the 1940s by George Hutchison that I don't think I got. I don't think I've seen it. Uh, there's a piece by Fintan O'Toole on the Celts. <laughs> Not those Celts. Uh, uh, a graphic novel. A long piece about the West Bank. Uh, and John, oh, whoa, boy, oh, boy, John Banville writing a review, another double review, of two books on uh, Cambridge spies, on mid-century English spy scandals. That'll be fun on its own, boy, oh, boy. That'll be probably the highlight, unless this Andrew Martin turns out to have some talent. I don't know if that's possible. Uh, oh, and uh, and look at that. Oh, that's a little belated. Uh, Tim Flannery reviews, Tim Flannery's fantastic. He's a great science writer, science and nature writer. Has a new book coming out. Uh this month, in fact, it might be out already uh, on the natural history of Europe. That's really, really good. Uh, make you look at, at the wild places of Europe in completely new ways. And he does a review here of Carl Zimmer's "She Has Her Mother's Laugh," which is about DNA. Uh, it's a little bit late uh, for it to be for the review to be appearing, but I don't care. That's fantastic, wonderful. Uh, well, there's a lot of political stuff in this issue, though. And we end with uh, Ken Starr's book. Ken, Ken's the former special prosecutor, special counsel, uh, Ken Starr, was once in charge of investigating Bill Clinton. Uh, and uh, he wrote a book. He wrote a memoir uh, called Contempt. And it is reviewed by Sean Wilentz, who's great. So, uh, okay, well, uh, then it looks like I haven't actually got into these yet. I'm so backlogged. But it looks like I'm going to have a lot of good reading to do. Uh, quite a bit of it by Andrew Martin. 
<laughs> well, I don't know how that happened. Uh, neither, these places won't even return my emails. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> I have other places. So, so that's it. A little, a little tour through the mail. Uh, I don't know what else there'll be today. Maybe I'll just make a video of singing. We don't like that, wouldn't we? <laughs> well, I'll be back. I'll think of something to talk to you about. <laughs> Until then, I'll see you soon. Thank you, BookTube.